All right, I think we're getting started with uh, another round of the uh, language circle. Uh, today's language circle is with a uh, dear friend, John Hale, from the University of Athens um, in the United States. Uh, before we start and before I start introducing John to those people who don't know him yet, um, I need to make a couple of announcements. Uh, the first being um, we are recording this uh, this uh, lecture series on uh, on uh, Zoom, basically on video. I mean, we are we are putting all the talks together into a big repository on YouTube um, for those who don't have time to make it. Um, if you don't want to be filmed and if you don't want to be on those videos, then please shut down your camera. And for those people in the room who don't want to be on camera, then move, just move outside the scope of the camera into one of the uh, corners of the room, probably. Uh, the second thing that I want to announce is that um, don't be disappointed if you can't just unmute yourself to ask a question. Originally, we had it that way, but then a couple of uh, funny uh, Zoom trolls came in and uh, disrupted uh, one of the presentations, and we don't want that to happen again. So um, if you have a question, please uh, use one of the icons in Zoom or type the question into the chat, and then uh, Carl is happy to... Um, to uh, give you the, the microphone, the right to speak. It's just a safety precaution. I'm sorry for that. Uh, the third thing that I want to announce is that after today's talk at 6 p.m., we're meeting at the Ratskeller in uh, Leipzig. For those people of you who are in the area, please uh, join us and uh, have a bit of an informal uh, meeting with, uh, with John. And the first thing is that we might be thrown out of Zoom today because there's a change on the license server of the Max Planck Institute. Uh, I'm sorry, um, we don't expect it to happen, but it could happen. So if something happens after 40 minutes, um, we have a fix for that, then just like bear with us and we'll, we'll tell you uh, what to do. Um, and now it's my great pleasure to introduce John Hale. Uh, John Hale holds a BA in Cognitive and Computer Science from Brown University, a Master in Cognitive Science from, John, from Johns Hopkins, and his PhD is also from Johns Hopkins where it was supervised by the famous uh, legendary, I should rather say, Paul Smolensky, Ed Stadler, and uh, Ted Gibson. That is, of course, quite a triplet there. Uh, until 2008, he worked as an assistant professor at Michigan State. Um, 2006, he was also visiting professor at Stanford. And 2012, he was a visiting professor at Potsdam University, and we didn't meet. We just found that we didn't meet in 2012. Um, until 2018, associative professor at Cornell University, um, a short interregnum at Google DeepMind in 2017 and since 2018, full professor of linguistics at the University of Georgia. So um, to me, John Hale is really, first of all, the person who introduced information theory as, uh, as a means of quantifying syntactic processing difficulty. And uh, I want to stress that he came up with all of this. So in a way, he's like um, the, the grandfather or godfather of uh, what what large language models do today in order to quantify processing effort, right? And that was, I think, before predictive coding really became a big thing, right? So your 2001 paper is probably one of the biggest uh, biggest inspirations in psycholinguistics uh, since uh, since Fraser's and Fodor's work, I would say. And um, he's still doing parsing, and I think that's important that in psycholinguistics we still try and, and uh, find a way to really focus on the way that humans process sentences um, based on all the theory that we have accumulated, based on the history of cognitive science. And he's, for me, still the, the, the person who's really uh, spearheading that uh, community, even in spite of all the developments and the large language model community. So, um, John, thank you for making it to Leipzig again. And we are all very much looking forward to your presentation on incremental parsing in the human brain. Thank you so much. Oh, and I forgot to say that John is wearing the very same tweet jacket that he wore the day we met in Baltimore. So thanks for yeah. that as well. It was my entry joke. Sorry, I fucked it up. <laughs> no, Lars, it was a great entry joke. And uh, thank you for that overly generous uh, introduction. I, I've always had a um, hearty welcome in Germany. Um, but nowhere more hardy uh, than, than here. So thank you so much. Um, and as Lars already uh, said, the last time I was in this room was uh, five years ago. Um, that was also a great trip. Uh, but a lot has changed in the last five years. 
Um, these days in the field of neurolinguistics, there's a lot of emphasis on uh, next word prediction. I don't know if you've heard about that. Um, I think my uh, former colleague, Morton Christensen, whose talk I would like to promote, is probably gonna talk uh, a lot about next word prediction uh, when he speaks in this series uh, in September. And I agree with uh, Professor Christensen that next word prediction uh, is a, a clearly an important phenomenon in human language. Uh, but I, I maybe don't go all the way with him um, because I'm worried about overemphasizing this kind of uh, processing. I think if we overemphasize this next word prediction, we risk uh, losing sight of a different um, and I think perhaps even more important aspect of human language, and that is syntactic structure. That's why I want to speak to you. So in this talk, um, I'd like to present three uh, studies that take a wider view, that, uh, including both next word prediction and syntactic structure. All of these studies, all these case studies involve modern uh, deep neural net language models. They, all the studies evaluate those models word by word predictions on a corpus of uh, neuroimaging time course data. Uh, that are recorded while participants listen to an audiobook. So they have some common attributes. Here's uh, where I'm going. The first study uh, is intended to offer a novel argument in favor of the idea, a novel demonstration that syntactic structure really should play a central role um, in, the, in our account of the human language comprehension process. Um, I need to say this, because the field's collective faith um, in this point, I think has been shaken over say the last five years with the rise of large language models such as uh, chat GPT. Um, so this is actually relevant at this time, um, but as I hope to show what these kinds of large models actually do is they lead us to a very clean characterization of local structure building in the human brain. Uh, so that's the first case study, syntax aware versus not aware. The second study addresses the cognitive algorithm by which such structure is recognized. Does that algorithm consider just one syntactic structure at a time, or do we somehow consider, do we somehow maintain multiple alternative structures um, as we go through moment by moment uh, language comprehension. That's the point of the second uh, study uh, that contrasts single path parsing with multi-path parsing. The third uh, case study that I wanna share with you today compares a particular syntactic theory called combinatory categorical grammar uh, against uh, two simpler alternatives, a uh, sequence oriented a uh, language model um, and a simpler kind of phrase structure, which is hierarchical, but doesn't have some of the cool things that expressive grammars like CCG uh, have. Does that, you guys understand basically where, where we're going today? Okay, um, so uh, just so that there's no surprises and no one is has high surprise all, um, these are what the answers to those questions are gonna be. Okay, so is everyone okay? Okay. All right, so turning uh, to the first study, uh, you know, I, I am aware that finding syntax in the brain uh, has been done many times before. And um, I am especially aware of that uh, here being in uh, Leipzig uh, right now. Life, uh, syntax has been found before in Leipzig many times um, in many different ways. And I, I kind of like uh, the fact that many different creative research strategies um, have all converged on this uh, primacy of structure in comprehend of sentence structure in comprehension. I think that's very promising. Um, so I'm seeking to add myself to this list uh, by showing you a different methodology that will lead to this same conclusion. Does that make sense? Um, with, with the methodology I'm gonna detail, uh, we ask, which computational model fits the brain data better? That's the basic question, which one fits better? And we can compare different 
configurations of essentially the same computational model, um, asking if we add this idea, does it fit better? We take this idea away, does it fit better? This has been called um, an in silico manipulation. It's a little bit grand. Um, in silico manipulation because it happens inside the silicon chips of a man-made computer rather than, say, in an experimental um, animal. Um, this approach is fundamentally correlational, uh, but it offers the prospect of using ecologically natural uh, stimuli uh, to study uh, comprehension in the usual case, the everyday uh, case. Okay. Um, so in our case, that ecologically natural uh, stimulus uh, is a whole book, The Little Prince, um, translated into English by David Wilkinson. Uh, we also have the um, original uh, French version of the book. Um, these data were collected by my uh, co-PI, Christophe Pallier, in Paris using roughly the same uh, protocol and a Mandarin Chinese version uh, collected by Jixing Li uh, in the context of a collaboration with uh, Jiangsu Normal University in Shuzhou. Um, all three uh, audiobooks are roughly the same length, about 100 minutes, um, and um, everything is freely available um, on the Open Neuro Archive. So there's no excuse for not having that on your hard drive is what I'm trying to suggest. Okay, so I said English, right? Sounds like this. Once, when I was six years old, I saw a magnificent picture in a book about the primeval forest called Real Life Stories. Okay, definitely English. That's what our participants heard while they were in the scanner through headphones and periodically we stopped them and we gave them a multiple choice quiz, which is very, 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 very easy to get right if you were awake for the previous 15 minutes. So that's, that's the basis of saying that it's language comprehension. Okay. Um, and for those who are not familiar with uh, fMRI or neuroimaging more broadly, uh, the data that I'm considering today is just a time series of the blood oxygen level dependent signal of the form you could, professional researchers are very familiar with. Uh, it's a unitless signal across time. TR is time of repetition, which for us is uh, two seconds. So this is just a time varying signal, slowly time varying signal. And we wanna know what would help explain this signal. Okay, um, to try to work that out, I'm using uh, an approach that I think falls into the category of uh, forward modeling. Our forward modeling approach has been used since about the mid 1990s by people like Sashank Varma and Marcel Just. The idea is that uh, you annotate the uh, stimulus text that participants are hearing in the scanner and you, with certain events like the end of a syntactic phrase or a rare word or something like that. You convolve uh, those annotations that are aligned in time with uh, a hemodynamic response to ask what it would look like in the bold signal if the bold signal were being driven by the factors, say, linguistic properties of the stimulus that you uh, hypothesize are there. Um, so these are each a little bit of a blur and when you average all those little bumps together, you get a big blur and people will tell you that you can't do this and it will never work. But if you have a hundred minutes of uh, data, you can sometimes find uh, statistically reliable effects. Okay. That's basically the idea. Um, so we're just gonna use plain old linear regression to relate the predicted fMRI time series. That's the thing at the bottom of the slide here to the observed fMRI time series and ask whether particular fitted coefficients or alternative regression models improve or make worse the fit. Okay. Um, there are many things that affect the bold signal, many of which I'm not interested in uh, for purposes of, of making the arguments that I laid out before. So we're gonna focus our analysis on specific properties of the stimuli of the stimulus book uh, with these kind of nuisance co-regressors. This is not pejorative, just that these are 
regressors that are going to be in our regression models to sop up variants that could easily be explained in a kind of low level way. Like for instance, uh, rare words. We know rare words are hard. I'm not trying to demonstrate that rare words are hard. So we have a nuisance regressor called word frequency, which will explain whatever variance in the bold signal could be explained that way. Similarly, um, I am very interested in prosody, but that's not the focus of these investigations. So uh, we have nuisance regressors for uh, the fundamental frequency of the narrator's voice and for the you know, RMS uh, intensity of the signal. So th these, are, these are interesting things, but just not for the purposes of this question. Um, uh, I have a review article that appeared in Annual Review of Linguistics. There are many studies that use this general technique. So if you're interested in uh, you know, the mechanics of this technique or what has already been studied with this kind of general approach, please check out that article. I think there's a DOI for it in the promo for this talk. Okay, so rather than review the studies and how this general approach has worked a few times before in the past, um, I'm just gonna trust you that you'll do the homework and you'll read up on this review article or you'll assign it next semester in your seminar um, and just move on to the, the case studies that I wanted. Is that okay? Okay. All right. So the first uh, study is the one where we ask whether a syntax aware uh, model fits better than one that is not explicitly uh, made aware, explicitly representing this uh, structure. So I keep using this word model, 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 model this, model that. What are these models? They are uh, language models. A language model is just an assignment of probability to strings of symbols from some, some agreed vocabulary. That's all it is. The term itself comes from automatic speech recognition uh, because as you know, the acoustic properties of speech under determine its textual transcription. A language model uh, was always needed to bias automatic speech recognition systems towards the sequence of words that the speaker probably intended. Speaker probably intended to talk about the same sorts of things that he always talks about. That's, that's really the motive. Um, this is, of course, also used in machine translation and in chatbots. Um, like when you ask ChatGPT to do your homework for you, that's language modeling. You give the homework as the prompt, and then you ask ChatGPT what would be the most probable completion of that homework prompt with the, say, desired answers of the homework. That's all about maximizing the probability of the suffix of the prompt string. So you've been using language models all your life. Um, nowadays, the dominant approach to building language models is based on a particular kind of artificial neural net called the transformer. The, uh, <clears throat> this, uh, here's what transformer looks like. The transformer uh, neural net is features uh, blocks like this that are repeated many, many times to make the net deep, okay? Um, and this block is, is not all that difficult to understand. Like if you look at the purple part that says feed forward, that's just the same uh, PDP neural net that you would remember from the mid 1980s or from intro to cognitive science, uh, something like that. There's a couple of newfangled things like layer norm uh, that are in here, but basically the transformer is mapping between these X's, which are like word embeddings for particular words uh, to other uh, vector representations, H1, H2, H3. Those are the contextualized H, maybe H for hidden or H for history, something like that. Those are other vectors that hopefully are gonna have more information about that word in the context that it actually appears. Um, the, the, the killer new thing in the transformer block is this reddish one that says multi-head attention or just, um, self-attention in particular, that's, uh, that's the special sauce uh, right there, which if you are a, a fan of PDP connectionism, uh, this is a kind of sigma pi unit that involves multiplication. I'm gonna go into that a little bit more, but basically this whole arrangement is repeated many times and, and this is a special part of it. 
Okay. Um, I said that the transformer is used for building language models, um, <clears throat> and it, it is uh, at the top, depending on how you orient things, at the top of the transformer, uh, you would have in a language model, a so-called language modeling head. Um, that's the part that takes the hidden representations H and unembeds them and then does some stuff with softmax and whatever, and uh, gives you probability distribution over the very next word. So that's how it um, assigns probability to strings by assigning probability to successor words. Remember, the talk is about next word prediction. That's where the next word prediction would happen. OK, um, so all of these layers, there's a lot of layers, and they ideally fit into the memory on your graphics processing unit, um, and they can be uh, parallelized very nicely. Um, the language modeling head shown here, this is a diagram from Jurafsky and Martin's textbook, uh, makes the predictions. And those predictions take into account um, a finite window of tokens, words that have come before. So um, here in this picture of the transformer language model, the next word prediction is in green. Um, these arrows represent the um, attention that the subsequent layer is paying to representations at a, a layer below it. So these arrows are the, the pattern of att the attention box. Um, and uh, this kind of language model is called uh, causal, which means it only looks at tokens that came before. Causal is the one that's interesting to us in cognitive science because uh, that means you're not using the future to, the future is not leaking into your prediction. You're operating in the way humans would incrementally as they hear words one at a time. I just wanna connect those two terminologies. Okay, so this is the standard way of making a transformer language model. Um, you can make a language model syntactic by changing the uh, strings that it is predicting. Instead of just predicting real words like the bluebird sings, um, you could model a sequence of symbols that also includes uh, labeled brackets too, like MP, bluebird, close bracket. As you guys know, the label bracketing is equivalent to a tree. So if you're predicting this bracketed string language, then you're really predicting the trees. And that makes it a joint model uh, of trees and their string uh, yields. So this, this idea was uh, popularized by Choi and Charniak in 2016, but really um, it, it builds on uh, a deep tradition of work, especially in France uh, by Bernard Lang. Okay, so the particular style of phrase structure that I'm gonna be talking about uh, a lot in this talk um, is the uh, pen tree bank style annotation, which is you know pretty heavily influenced by Chomsky's extended standard uh, theory. Um, it's got you know DP. It's got uh, you know WH words are tagged with a special WH, etc. Um, these trees do not represent uh, discontinuity or movement. So the conclusion, um, at least of the first two of the first case study will pertain only to local phrase structure uh, building. We, uh, in this project, uh, which was headed by my student, uh, Michael uh, Wolfman, rescored trees that Michael obtained by parsing the little prints uh, using a recurrent neural net grammar. This is a pre-transformer approach to language modeling, which I know I talked about last time I was here five years ago. But suffice it to say, we were able to get these trees or sentences, say, of the little prince. Okay, that part is not controversial or challenging. Um, what is, I think, exciting is that uh, my colleagues um, in the language team at Google DeepMind, especially uh, Chris Dyer, added a way to bias uh, the transformer language model uh, to work in a way that is constrained or, or biased towards this sort of tree structure, okay? And they did that by tweaking the attention mechanism um, to encourage the transformer language model to attend to syntax. The main idea is that 
when you, if you look at this uh, diagram along the vertically along each of the rows here, you'll see that we're just going through each symbol from the labeled uh, bracketing. Okay, but after hearing the blue bird, we get to the right bracket of NP, that's the right boundary of NP, this orange thing happens. Um, at, when you reach the end of the constituent with this new tweak, you attend to all of its daughters and you make, at a new layer, you make a new compressed vector representation which combines all of the information from all of the uh, daughters. Further down at subsequent rows, the syntax bias transformer can only attend to uh, you know, representations of tokens that are outside of the compressed constituent. And you can see that, that at the subsequent row, this is all blank now. We're not looking inside uh, the NP. Tweaking attention in this way promotes a kind of tree-like information flow inside the transformer. Um, and earlier work along these lines suggested that the compressed representations end up encoding basically something about headedness, as you would expect. Um, <clears throat> so that's, that's, there's a lot more in this paper um, by Laurent uh, Sartan. I encourage you to read it, but this is basically the main idea is that, uh, you know, Sartan and the co-authors were able to change transformers to have this more tree-like information flow. And that, that led to them renaming it with the catchy name Transformer Grammars. That's what Transformer Grammars are. They have an attention mechanism that works like this. Okay, um, since uh, Transformer Language Models and Transformer Grammars are a fortiori language models, um, both of them can be used to make predictions about word-by-word -word processing difficulty via the surprisal linking hypothesis. Um, which Lars spoke about in his intro. I'm not going to presume that you know about this, uh, but I'll, I will tell you that surprisals are just a negative log likelihood of the word in its uh, context. Uh, the basic idea is that the more probable the word is, given what comes before it, uh, the less surprising um, it is. So if, if something is completely certain, it's not surprising at all. If it's very uncertain, I think you've heard about this. This has been well supported by experimental work, experimental work with self-paced reading, eye tracking, many other methodologies. And the, uh, for me, the interesting uh, part of the surprisal linking hypothesis is that it enables us to link uh, data, whether from the brain or behavior, to alternative conceptions of sentence structure. Surprisal is not a theory of language. It's just a, a helper that enables us it's instrumental in the task of connecting a real conception of language to word-by-word uh, -word processing data. So um, the two different, I said this was an in silico manipulation, two different conceptions of language are realized as two different language models. Here is the methodology. Uh, we have transformer grammar. That's the one that's biased towards syntax that uh, has the the tweaked attention mechanism. And then we have transformer XL, which I'm just calling unconstrained. It's, it's perfectly possible that transformer XL in its training would learn a little bit about syntax. Like it's perfectly possible that people could go one or two syllables without realizing that I don't know German. Hopefully, hopefully, but it's unconstrained. There's no guarantee that this model uh, has any syntax explicitly represented. The first thing I want to say about these two is that they're both um, good language models. Once trained, their performance is as if all they had to do is choose from about 30 different words to guess the next word on average. Um, so like this can be measured using perplexity. Um, these values are better if they're lower. If you're less perplexed, it's better. So you get that connotation. Um, uh, Transformer grammar perplexity and Transformer XL are both a little bit above 30. This is very remarkable and mind-blowing to me personally because, um, you know, when I came here five years ago, uh, we were still talking about n-grams, you know, where the five gram would have had a perplexity value of something like 170. Um, and just a few years ago, I was personally working with neural net language models whose perplexity values were in the neighborhood of 100. So to push this down from 170 to 100 down to 30 something, 
that's the progress. Um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, it's mind blowing. So they're both, and they're both pretty good. Okay, I want to establish that they're both they're both good. Um, to use these models to localize syntax in the brain, we ask by how much does adding surprisals, word by word surprisal values from them, um, improve a mass univariate uh, analysis of bold time series. This improvement, so see how we're going from the regression that doesn't have it to a regression where the surprisal is added in as another uh, feature. Um, the improvement, we can quantify this improvement in terms of an R squared value, uh, which we can uh, you know, find using cross-validation. So by how much we know R squared, the, the correlation coefficient with the bold data is going to improve. It's going to improve if you add another predictor, which is not totally garbage. Um, but uh, how much does it improve? Does it improve by a lot, or does it just improve by a little? That's the game plan. Okay. So um, <clears throat> in these um, pictures here, I'm using the greater than symbol to just mean uh, you know the the contrast with the base model that just has a nuisance regressors. So you can already see uh, with transformer grammar, there's a lot, uh, there's a, a big kind of um, blob that means superior uh, temporal there, maybe a little bit less so uh, with transformer Excel. Both models capture variants in bilateral um, STG. We can compare how much is captured um, uh, by forming Z maps and using a T test to ask what is different between these two models. Uh, and here's where it's uh, different. Um, there's a bilateral effect uh, of the syntax bias model in superior temporal regions, including auditory uh, cortex. There's also an effect in um, anterior uh, temporal uh, regions. Okay, so I want to emphasize, again, I was not trying to derive a totally new result that you never heard before, but rather to offer you a new argument, a new basis on which to conclude that syntax is operative in comprehension. And I just want to say that I think this result is consistent uh, to, to a large degree with prior work using other methodologies. I'll just mention a couple. Um, Christophe Pallier, together with Anne-Dominique de Vauchel and Stanislas de Hen, found a parametric effect of constituent size all the way along the ventral pathway, including temporal pole, interior uh, STS, STS in general. Um, this was with reading. Our study was with listening. Okay, so different modality. Um, some of these uh, temporal lobe regions also came out in Leila Webby's uh, 2014 decoding study, which was also with reading. Um, she did look a little bit at the uh, dependency label on the, I think the governor word, not on the dependent, but just on the governor. Um, <clears throat> So she also gets some of this right, uh, yeah, right hemisphere uh, stuff as well. So I'm just emphasizing the bilaterality, not the specific uh, regions. And of course, um, uh, there's a lovely meta-analysis by Emiliano Zaccarella, which mentions some of these temporal regions too. I need to be um, upfront with you. We did not find an effect in Broca's area um, we know that there's something there, uh, you know, in language, but with naturalistic uh, stimuli, it seems to be harder um, to detect. Um, and I think the literature has been <clears throat> reconfirming that ever since uh, the Mazoyer uh, et al. pet study in 1993. So um, there's a chord with earlier work, especially in these temporal, uh, some of these temporal regions. I would like to summarize that for now just by saying that syntax is alive and well and it's exercising structures in the brain's temporal lobe. Um, the novel part of this is that that can be shown on the basis of surprisal values alone uh, in a naturalistic uh, stimulus, just by contrasting a language model that does versus a language model that eh, maybe doesn't uh, use syntactic uh, structure. And I think the, uh, the localization that we're finding in primary auditory cortex could be consistent uh, with an idea that a previous speaker, An Kaitel, I think, uh, mentioned that maybe uh, you know all levels of ling linguistic analysis 
are being pursued at the earliest possible stage of processing. You know, maybe maybe syntax is happening like just immediately as it hits your ear. You know, it's it's, it's conditioning your expectations. I don't know. Um, so let's leave it there um, and move on to a question whose outcome was not as obviously known um, in advance, and that's the the second case study about uh, single path versus multi path uh, parsing. Okay, so uh, this this question has to do with ambiguity, which I think a lot of people are familiar with, but I just want to pump the intuition by showing you uh, global ambiguity. In a global ambiguity, like I saw the man with the telescope, uh, the prepositional phrase with the telescope can metaphorically attach to either the noun phrase, the man, or the verb phrase uh, that begins with the word uh, saw. This attachment ambiguity. Um, but if you think about word by word incremental parsing, the topic of this talk, um, as assigning an, a syntactic analysis little by little, word by word, I think it, it becomes apparent pretty quickly that there's also temporary ambiguity. Uh, for instance, this uh, head modifier ambiguity, which arises because the word desert could be either an adjective or a noun. Uh, so um, analysis A might continue, the desert is beautiful. That, that string really does occur in the English translation that we have of the Little Prince. Analysis B, which has the same first two words, might continue, the desert sand blows. Is that poetic? It really could happen, but it just didn't happen um, in the little prints. So within cognitive science, my view, my reading is it's remained unresolved for quite a while, whether the human parser considers just one analysis at a time or whether it maintains some sort of portfolio of multiple um, analyses. Um, I'm using the terminology path here, single path versus multi-path following Rick Lewis, who is not depicted on this slide. Um, because he made the point in the year 2000 that the, the number of paths is really a matter of cognitive process rather than cognitive architecture, which underlyingly we know has to be parallel, you know, at some level of analysis. Both of these proposals, single path and multipath, have been formalized computationally in various years, uh, ways over the years. For instance, the famous Marcus parser, um, which was discussed by Amy Weinberg and Bob Berwick in chapter five of their um, 1984 book, um, that's a single path alternative. Um, a notable multi-path theory is called rank parallel parsing. It was popularized in Ted Gibson's 1991 uh, dissertation. A nice computational version of rank parallel parsing uh, was given by Brian Rourke in his dissertation. So both of these have been worked out you know, in fairly explicit um, detail. I, I think it's interesting to try to adjudicate this question using uh, large language models now that it's 2024, right? So in this uh, case study, we used uh, Bloom, which has its own emoji apparently. Um, Bloom is uh, an yet another transformer-based uh, language model, just like Transformer XL uh, from the previous case study. Um, it was created through a collaboration with the French government uh, with broad participation from many organizations in the field of artificial intelligence. Um, and in 2022, uh, Bloom was proclaimed to be the world's largest open multilingual uh, large language model with major emphasis uh, <clears throat> on English, Chinese, and French. If your favorite language is not in that pie chart, write to the French government. Um, we uh, can use Bloom to find uh, dependency analyses, which I know is a favorite of some people in this room. This is the dependency analysis part, okay? <clears throat> um, just if you're not familiar with dependency grammar, it differs from phrase structure grammar insofar as there are no uh, internal nodes like NP or VP, um, but the same notion of ambiguity still arises. So in this example, in my pajamas, uh, could attach to either uh, elephant, which it does in this case, or uh, it, it could attach to shot, which it, it isn't attached to in this particular dependency analysis. Um, same ambiguity. Uh, another commonality with phrase structure grammar um, at the level of parsing is that 
Classical approaches to parsing phrase structure and uh, dependency structure, classical incremental approaches, both use a push down stack. Uh, for instance, with dependency parsing, you need a push down stack to keep track of, of words that haven't found their governor yet. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's, th that's one of the key things you have to decide when you're making an incremental dependency parser. Who's my governor? Should I draw that arc? What label should I put on that arc? Or should I just do nothing and move on to the next word? If only you could resolve questions like that, you could incrementally assign dependency analyses of this sort, okay? And you can do that. You can get a uh, large transformer lang uh, language model to do that by putting uh, different kinds of heads, not just the language modeling head, but adding different heads to the, the transformer itself. Um, <clears throat> so in this diagram, the heads are not on top, but it's the same idea of just adding a different head on. Um, these heads are actually classifiers that will assign a discrete probability distribution to all alternatives. So like if in a certain situation you think, oh, it's with 70% probability, I think we should, you know, the arc should go to the left, but maybe only 30% probability the arc should go to the right. So you're not necessarily choosing, you're just assigning probability to the possible choices. <clears throat> so the particular, um, that's the overall big picture idea. The particular uh, incremental parsing uh, method that we, stra parsing strategy is the right word for this, that we use um, is due to Joachim uh, Nivre, who literally wrote the book on this uh, topic. And this table summarizes the whole parsing strategy. The before and after columns uh, show how the push down stack changes at each step. Sometimes you push things on the stack, sometimes you pop them off. Um, the, um, and there's names like shift uh, and left arc and right arc. Uh, um, these things are, and then there's also probabilities uh, with which you take those actions. So we're gonna use the classifier heads to estimate these probabilities, like the probability of which transition should we pick? Should we pick shift or should we pick one of the reduce transitions. Uh, P dir is the probability of arc direction, left or right. That was the example I was just <clears throat> um, trying to promote. All of this stuff is very well understood, I think, within computational linguistics. What is less widely appreciated, um, except by some experts in the audience, is that you can tabulate these uh, computations to exactly rank the parses. So once you have this parsing strategy, you can pretty much get a uh, rank parallel if you do a little bit of programming. By tabulate, I mean recursively solve uh, for the best sequence of dependency parsing actions. So um, up here, um, this is a deductive system which um, expresses uh, the dependency parsing strategy that I just showed you on the previous slide. Uh, this is the the work of Marco Kuhlmann, which was adopted in uh, Jan Buys and uh, Phil Blunson in 2018. Um, if you make a table of all possible deductions in this system uh, via a technique called dynamic programming, which is um, due to Richard Bellman in the 1950s, uh, you can come up with a ranked, ranked parallel parsing. <laughs> you can have each analysis, each incremental dependency analysis associated with a numerical value about how good it is. This is Ted's, Ted Gibson's idea of rank parallel, I think. Um, if we just look at the top one on that list, the orange part, then we have single path parsing. We always just look at that one, single path. Um, if we look at more, like say we look at the next four, um, you could have the top five, you got a five way, five path parsing. Does that make sense? All we need to do is rank these things and we can use uh, dynamic programming to do that. We will again connect models of incremental parsing to human data via the surprisal uh, linking hypothesis. Um, and note please that surprisal can be thought of as the combination of two contributions. Um, one contribution uh, just has to do with 
the word, the rareness of the word, okay? Um, and another pro uh, contribution is properly syntactic. Is this the high attachment or the low attachment, or is it adjectival or nominal or whatever? And in fact, people that have worked on incremental parsing, um, this is a great frustration that so much of this value is dominated by the lexical part. Um, it makes it hard to compare um, if what you're really interested in is deciding which syntactic structure is wrong. So in this project, um, we wanted to focus on the blue part of this bar graph, relatively small contributions uh, from different syntactic choices. So we adopted uh, what's called the syntactic surprisal, which doesn't involve the word generation probability. It only involves the uh, transition. Okay. <clears throat> and after all, we're talking about an fMRI study where people are actually hearing the words. It's not up to them to choose the words. They're stuck with the words that we arranged in the stimulus. So we're not interested in whether they think they were probable or not. We're interested in their analysis, their interpretation. Okay, so I wanna underline at this point, syntactic surprisal was introduced by Rourke. Um, it has to do with these T's, the transitions at a given point from say the previous word to the next word. Um, and this is only up to, uh, word I minus one. We cannot see into the future. We are modeling incremental, uh, you know, word by word um, analysis. Okay, and using the same methodology as before, the in silico manipulation, um, we can add in the surprisal values that we derive from a particular language model, say the one that's constrained to just look at single path versus the one that can look at multi-path. Okay, so just for, to, to have a neat comparison, we looked at um, five-way parsing. Um, so here's the results on um, English. This is comparing five-way multi-path parsing to single-path parsing um, with the English translation of the a little prints. These are um, showing the outcome of t-tests on r-squared increase maps um, that are highlighting some STG areas, um, uh, and in English, um, also some, some differences uh, in the parietal lobe that have been linked by Lars uh, to memory. Um, so I think these are sensical, and this is showing that five-way uh, multipath parsing is a better account, a better generalizing account than the single path one. Um, as I, I tried to emphasize, we seek to be as multilingual as we can afford to be, and we also looked at uh, Chinese, in Chinese, uh, these areas are more uh, middle temporal gyrus, uh, and they're, um, they're also bilateral. Okay. Um, as before with the transformer grammar, uh, we did not see activation in uh, Broca's area, but that could be because the ambiguity resolution problems posed in the little prints, which after all is meant to be an enjoyable, easy to read, uh, book maybe aren't as strong as in earlier studies like uh, Rob Mason in 2003 or Jennifer Rod in uh, 2010 that explicitly used garden path stimuli. Um, however, I think our results, oh, by the way, I just want to say, note that the areas are not exactly the same in English and Chinese. I think this is a tantalizing suggestion uh, that typological differences potentially could suggest multiple solutions to the problem of language, whatever that problem is. Um, it might be solved in different ways, different societies, different communities. I don't know, fascinating question. Um, what our results do accord with is earlier work on the exact same uh, corpus. And this is a slide from uh, a paper by Benoit Crabbe, which appeared in 2019. Uh, Crabbe's analysis was not addressed specifically at the question of uh, multipath versus single path. He was trying to adjudicate between two different ways of doing beam search, say that maybe one is more cognitively uh, plausible than the other. Um, and another difference, which I think is a good thing, is that uh, Benoit Crabbe's analysis was with phrase structure parsing. Ours is with dependency parsing, 
Um, so I think it's it's nice to see a convergent uh, implication of say uh, you know superior STG across those two grammar formalisms. So it would be wrong to go home from this talk and say John Hale told me that dependency grammar is the bestest. No, John Hale tells tells you that there's a new argument using dependency grammar which converges on the same conclusions that you would already derive using. Okay. Um, but enough about that. I think we've we've answered the second question uh, from the roadmap uh, by saying that the fMRI evidence that we've collected uh, appears to suggest that the comprehension process is better thought of as pursuing multiple analyses at once rather than just a single path. Okay, I'd like to move on. You guys are so patient, but I can't help. I've come all this way, and I really want to move on to the third case study comparing surprisals from la uh, large language models to more classical notions of uh, parsing difficulty. That's, that's my agenda in the last uh, study. And it's a study that considers, as I said before, uh, a grammar formalism called combinatory categorial uh, grammar, which is a generative grammar. Here is where it sits in the family tree of generative grammar. Um, uh, it's been championed over the years uh, by Mark Steedman, who received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Association for Computational Linguistics. So as you might imagine, it's blessed with an abundance of computational tools, such as tree banks, uh, parsers, uh, grammar fragments. Uh, but for me, well, that, that is also the reason. I think the main reason to be interested in CCG from a cognitive perspective is that Steedman has always emphasized the compatibility that CCG offers with word-by-word -word incremental processing algorithms. And that's the motive for my considering it uh, now. Um, if you've never heard of CCG, don't panic. Uh, it's easy to get started with uh, categorical grammars like CCG if you think of fractions from elementary school. So in CCG, um, you know, you also have a noun, noun phrases like Marcel, the proper name, completeness is a noun. Let's just call that NP. But the fun part of CCG is that you have more complex categories, like the ones that go with the verb proved. Um, these complex categories have slashes in them. Um, this slash right here, right meaning slash, slash NP means I would like to combine with an NP on my right. I really would. I'm seeking an NP. In fact, there is an NP right there. So we can combine them. And just like fractions in elementary school, this bottom slash cancels out. Does that intuition land with you guys? It's like fractions in elementary school. And same thing with the other. Now we have a left slash uh, that says, if only you gave me an NP on my right, this is the Stephen notation now. This, if you only gave me an NP on my right, then I would be a sentence S. Okay, and so that's exactly what happens. Okay. Um, it's, uh, yeah, the less than signs here name particular combinatory operations that are called forward application and backward application. Um, CCG is an expressive grammar, and I don't want to go too deep into that, um, other than to say that CCG is expressive enough to handle a lot of the phenomena that we see in the world's languages, um, such as WH questions here. Um, you know, what we would have analyzed with the trace in transformational generative grammar, uh, maybe he like, he like trace best, or what games is associated with some gap position, you know, that's the direct object of like. Um, in CCG, you would analyze that using this colorful blue slash. That's the slash of missing elements, which can then be matched in the gap position. Blue is not the official color in CCG. I'm just highlighting it. Okay. Um, and so, uh, yeah, uh, what we're going to do is use these. Note that these are trees, by the way. They're just upside down, such that the root is at the bottom. And I'm, I'm not going to force you to keep reading trees upside down. I'm going to flip them over. Um, and note that on these CCG derivation trees, uh, you can define an incremental complexity metric along the lines that Lynn Frazier reviewed uh, back in 1985. Um, for instance, we can count how many of these derivation tree nodes would be visited by a shift reduced parser uh, since the last word. So like at Earth here, 
we could metaphorically reduce this constituent and this constituent. And that's why this number is two here. We can't do any such reductions, it is, but when we get to not, we can reduce this and that, okay? So that's where these, we can define a complexity metric immediately on these trees. These sorts of node counts measure parsing work. They're literally counting how many nodes you have to build. Um, and we can compare them to surprisals from large language models. Why not? It's just a time series of numbers. They may be incommensurable units, but they're perfectly good as a predictor. So um, in this study, uh, we looked at yet another large language model uh, called Chinchilla, which is a um, DeepMind brand uh, model. It has 277 times more parameters in it than the transformer grammars that I talked about earlier. Uh, and yet, it is far more economical in parameters than some of its age mates in the large language model space. So this is a line from uh, the NeurIPS paper, which won outstanding paper, uh, making the, the proud engineering comment that uh, Chinchilla was more miserly than, say, Megatron Turing NLG, which used 530 billion parameters. So using fewer parameters is good. Um, if you're able to perform as well, you're, you're better generalizing, um, et cetera. And in fact, the, the burden of this paper uh, in 2022 was to argue that it indeed does perform better on natural language tasks than some of those competitors. Okay, we again did a linear regression analysis, um, but at this time we used held out uh, data. We asked how well a regression model trained on 13.3 minutes of bold signal did at the task of predicting held out other 13.3 uh, minutes. We, uh, we use the human connectome projects, uh, volumetric parcellation. We mathematically ablated these regression models by scrambling certain regressors, permuting them so that they no longer align with the spoken little prints in time. And we ask, how badly does this mathematical ablation hurt generalization performance? And we can ask, uh, you know, we could compare neuroimages along this dimension to locate regions where a particular regressor is important for explaining the time course. Okay, so here is the comparison between a particular node count uh, from CCG derivations against the surprisals from the chinchilla large language models. And there are indeed uh, some temporal regions, maybe middle temporal uh, regions where the grammar-based CCG predictor offers a better generalizing account than the large language model. You know, however, you know, many gigabytes this was trained on, it didn't learn the things that are in the CCG-based predictor. Okay. So <clears throat> um, we can also put these CCG node counts up against node counts from a, a simpler yet still structured uh, conception of language. So here is the same comparison uh, against node counts from the naive phrase. I'm calling them naive, but they're not naive. They're from the pen tree bank. From the pen tree bank uh, uh, trees, uh, CCG node counts are better in some of these same areas. Um, this shows that there's still variance in the brain signal that an expressive grammar can model above and beyond simpler models and um, yeah, I think uh, you know some of these temporal areas that we found in this comparison align very well with the work uh, I talked about last time with minimalist grammars. So I think uh, that's a convergent uh, finding as well. So anyway, again, I, you guys were already very patient. Um, I've reached the end of the material I wanted to talk about in the roadmap. And I'd like to leave you uh, with now with the suggestion that next word prediction, um, far from suggesting some kind of structure-free statistical learning, uh, instead confirms the role of syntax in human language uh, comprehension. And it sheds light on new questions. Like it gives a reason to characterize human parsing as multipath rather than single path. It offers a new argument in favor of expressive formalisms like uh, CCG and minimalist grammars over and above uh, simpler you know, approaches just like pen, pen tree bank uh, phrase structure. So I think next word prediction is fine. 
But the conclusion that we should draw uh, from it is one that I think fits very much into the arc of the cognitive science of language. Okay, I'd like to thank the people that um, really did this work, uh, such as my uh, master's students, Michael Wolfman, Umberta Franz Lubbers, if you're um, looking for someone who um, should do a PhD in the neurobiology of language and you know already speaks German uh, very well, I think you should really call her. If you're looking for someone who to do a postdoc in about a year, Donnie Dunnigan was involved in all of this work. I'd like to also thank my co-authors at uh, Dimein Milos Stanievich from the Hall Sartre, um, my uh, co-PIs, uh, Jonathan uh, Brennan and Christophe Pallier, who I already mentioned. Uh, I thank the US um, NSF. And lastly, I would like to encourage all of you uh, to give this sort of work a try. I didn't see anyone downloading the data while I was speaking, um, but uh, there's the address um, and you can, you can just go and do it. If you don't have another project already on deck, maybe you have an idea in this space. Again, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Jim. Thank you very much for the rich presentation, John. Um, questions from the online audience first, please. Raise your hand, type something into the chat, please. Can we see, do you see? We uh, would jump to the beginning, I think. We would see hands and there's nothing in the chat yet. Okay, so you just need more time to think about it. Then I will ask in the, in the audience questions. Yeah. Yeah, thanks a lot for the great talk. Um, I, I was wondering, so you, in, in your models of uh, the bow time series, right, you accounted for quite a few um, nuisance reversals of, say, uh, work frequency and, and uh, uh, what else? Uh, for RMS, uh, intensity, F0. Turing features, right. Uh, but um, there are other kind of features that relate to meaning, right, that might be might not be accounted for. Uh, so I was wondering how do you, uh, how can we be sure that these results truly really relate to syntax? Yeah. And especially relating to to the to your last kind of big conclusion, right? That next word prediction is about syntax. Why why are you so sure that it's not about the meaning? Okay. Yeah. Let me let me take that question. First, um please do not misunderstand me. It's a, a sometimes when people say, you know, X is about A they hear X is only about A. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying X is at least about A, okay? Um, but your, your question is dead on and I, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about it. Um, so uh, the written up version of um, the um, transformer grammars uh, demonstration does include a lexical semantic control and I, for the purpose of this talk, I had Michael rerun it without that. So I could say it was the same across all three uh, studies, but you get the same result whether you put in the lexical semantic control or not. And let me just explain what I mean by lexical semantic control. This is actually an idea that was given to me by Alex Huth. So thank you, Alex Huth, um, for this idea. Uh, you know, if you really believe that um, language processing was not, had nothing to do with syntax and was really just about, you know, guessing the lexical meaning, whatever order it's in, then you should be able to understand sentences by just knowing just the word meanings, right? <laughs> and so what we did is we tried to put in more nuisance regressors that correspond to just the word meanings. It is widely accepted, maybe provisionally or maybe uncritically in computational linguistics right now, the uh, distributional hypothesis that word meaning is well described by the distributional pattern that words go into, and furthermore, that you can you can make a semantic model just by uh, uh, collating co-occurrences. Um, and so we did that. We used the fast text uh, model, and then uh, dimensionality reduced that to just the top five most consequential distinctions. Um, according to Alex, that'll get you. Pretty much everything that fast text knows. It may know some other stuff in the lower order terms, but we included five different nuisance regressors, like first principal component of fast text, second principal component of fast. You know, we did five of those, and the results really do not change when you throw that in. Thank you. 
I only heard about that once I talked to Alex when he came to Atlanta. So that only entered my thinking later, but we did, we did try. Thank you. I was wondering, there's a, I think the web still CCG, it's still very much somehow, it seems to me uh, so there's a clear definition and distinction between syntax and semantics. And there's other ways of seeing syntax that somehow influence some parts. I'm thinking about still generative approaches mm -hmm. to maybe Pustajowski and stuff like that, where you put some word meaning inside so that the two levels are not straight, like uh, very uh, separately, uh, very clearly, right? Do you think, um, so also what, what is your idea about this? So you think syntax is necessarily separated with that sense, or uh, do you think it would possibly add, right, to have an even more complex model of syntax and grammar, which also takes into consideration lexical? Uh, yes, I, I, that's very interesting. Um, I take it as a good thing that uh, both CCG and the particular flavor of minimalism that I've looked at in the past, both share the property of being directly compositional, which basically means that you could, in principle, read the compositional formal semantics right off the syntactic derivation. There's no extra interpretive semantics <clears throat> steps in, countenanced in those approaches. Um, I agree that uh, it, it would be very interesting to uh, consider richer, perhaps more explicit uh, notions of, of lexical semantics along the lines of Pustayevsky. One of the downsides of a distributional approach like fast text that is so beloved, so it's the darling. It was the darling, but I think and they found a different girlfriend later. It was the darling of computational linguists. Um, one of the downsides, it's not necessarily interpretable. So you don't know what the lexical meaning is. Maybe you know that it's different from some other lexical meanings, but you can't really put your finger on, you know, what exactly is the argument structural contribution, what are the, you know, selectional restrictions. Um, so yeah, I think uh, considering that would be uh, useful. I think if if people are interested in that uh, direction from a, a brain perspective, I would encourage them to read the work of Charlotte uh, Cocheteau. Uh, she has some some great work along these lines. Um, and I think developing that to make that even more interpretable would be an excellent project. If there's any funding agency representatives in the room, I think that should definitely be supported. Okay, next question is from the online audience. Ming Xiang, please. Hey, John. Um, thanks for a great talk. Sorry, I'm not in a situation to turn on my camera. Um, so I have a question about the single versus multiple path study you mentioned. So do you think it is possible that for individual participants, it's still single path, but different people may have different preferences in their parsing decision? Would that still lead to the same results you observed at the at the group level? I think it could. I think it could. Um, like if. If you were, the scenario that seems more plausible to me is that you can switch back and forth between single path and multi-path, maybe in response to task demands. And then you know, the result that I shared with you would follow if more often than not, you were pushed to consider multiple analyses, like right. on balance. Right. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I think that's actually extremely interesting um, because uh, you know this could be strategic. Everyone has the experience of trying to understand a speaker who is very difficult to understand, or you know, read something that's just convoluted and hard to. And so then you like really focus, and you're just going very slow and trying to read one at a time. And maybe in a scenario like that, you aren't considering very many alternatives. I haven't looked into the individual differences aspect at all, but I think. We're, we're looking here at a phenomenon which is near the boundary of conscious awareness. And so it might be uh, it might be possible to affect it with some kind of instructions, manipulation or something like that. Right, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Questions either in the room or online. I have some questions for me to ask. Um, First one is on the first example data set you showed where you contrast the 
has syntax versus the not has syntax model. Can you show the slide again, yeah, yeah. please? The results slide. Mm -hmm. So this is, ah, that's both tails. So there's no like real cluster where you get an improvement for the, no, wait, that's not the slide that I mean. Can you, okay. can you I think the next one, yeah, this one. So you have transformer XL versus base, you have transformer versus base. Um, how about transformer XL versus transformer grammar? I mean, is that... I only compare the delta, not the two models to that. Ah, okay, because I'm wondering, like, about the extent of this cluster here. Mm -hmm. um, see how this spreads out more throughout. It's different. Yeah, it's different. And that's, that's kind of, well, the scales are, so this is much weaker. This mm -hmm. is probably, well, that's 1.5 times the size of this in terms of, so it might be, might be spurious, but I'm just wondering, because this is so lateralized, this is more extent, extended, and I was wondering whether that has has any meaning. Now, um, that's, that's just a question. Um, the other one is um, that the, all the, the middle and medial temporal lobe activities that you find for your different types of models, um, they're all consistent with the source reconstruction of the ELAN, right? So that's the EMEG data from, from the like late 2000s, um, finding that the ELAN is predominantly generated in the temporal cortex. It's not in the frontal lobe. Now, what do you tell Josef Brzezinski and uh, well, and what do you tell uh, William Matchin, right? By the way, when you don't have PSCG, anyway. But um, so I, I was speculating, like how how can this be? And you were mentioning in the very beginning of the presentation that these these models they tend to capture or pick up local transitions, right? They 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 are they are aware about the long distance context and they can know kind of what to use for your long distance prediction, but it would still be dominated by all the local stuff in between, like an anti-locality, right? So I'm wondering whether whether there is a way to to like dissect the local and the long distance uh, component a little more uh, in the in the in the model slash uh, predictor that you that you're generating from. Yes, right? because you mentioned it might be invisible. It might be invisible, and I'm, I'm always, of course, because I was raised here. I'm, I'm still thinking about this idea that that the temporal lobe does local phrase structure versus the yeah. the IFG doing doing and um, the long distance dependencies because it's probably also related to long to to memory and and the phonological loop, etc. But how could you? How could you speak to that and reconcile these two camps? I mean, the discussion has become rather quiet, I think, now that William has pushing the PSCG and it's all temporal and, and comprehension and so on and so forth, and Grozinski is really off the map. But still, I mean, there's all these findings in the literature that, that find in healthy populations. And I think Nina Dronka's uh, lesion data and the, the glioma data from Japan, you also have results pointing to IFG still somehow being at least active during comprehension. Yeah. And I believe it is. I believe it absolutely is. Um, uh, I think when, you know, once we have uh, structural descriptions, you can use any property of them to define a complexity metric. So one, one idea that just comes to mind is I showed you guys uh, uh, the um, uh, You know, I saw Vera Dunberg in the audience, and I, I want to acknowledge that uh, this would be very consistent with her idea of combining memory and expectation in some manner. You could say, hey, whenever you get to the gap position, you're going to need to do some memory operation to retrieve the other blue uh, element. That's, a, that's another regressor that we could put in there. Um, there we have another um, paper that isn't... Uh, so much about next word prediction, but it's about objects extracted relative mm -hmm. clauses. And there are just barely enough object extracted relative clauses in the little prints to be able to eke out some level of statistical significance. Um, uh, and there, there's also, um, so that that is not a, a stunning uh, validation of uh, either uh, Professor Friedrichi or Professor Machin, but I think um, 
that's the close that's as close as we've been able to get with naturalistic. So I think what, what what I'm really saying to everyone in the room here is that now is when you step in with the creativity of second year grad student that says, I can do that. I could do way better than that. All they need to do is that GBT is not going to tell you. You need to think of it yourself. Yeah, no, I, as far as I understood those those systems, the there might be long distance processing in there, but it's conflated with all the other predictive processing that is going on. Yes, yes the exactly. Local to local exactly. Time. That might be this type of long distance prediction and that type of long distance prediction. Is, that's what makes it hard to interpret the numbers that those systems spin out. Right? That's true. And so, so the, the natural response then is to, is to like titrate it out and say, okay, we're not going to look at just raw surprise all in its classical sense, try to look at little uh, bits of it. Um, I think that, yeah, the, the more basic point is like, just next word prediction is not going to displace uh, any of these pictures that are so influential. In fact, it's pretty consistent. It may not completely rederive everything that we already know, but why should we expect that? It's at least consistent. Um, the other thing I want to just point out, just by way of rambling, unless there's another question, um, is that with the um, uh, I don't I don't think I have this slide, but uh, Well, let me uh, let me just say with the um, um, with the uh, transformer uh, grammar stuff. One of the things that's in this paper, yeah, in the in the Sartal, uh, 2022 paper, is um, an analysis of where the uh, transformer grammar, the one that's syntax aware, where that 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 one is different from the uh, transformer XL. So in a way, you would think the transformer XL ought to be better because it's literally more flexible. It can do more stuff, okay? But transformer grammar like has one tie hand tied behind its back saying you must attend to lower layers in this way that is constrained. Um, so it's amazing that it's a superior language model by a couple points. Um, but um, uh, Transformer XL is good at some things, and one of the things that they, that they demonstrate in that paper that it's better at is handling um, copying in language. So there are there are parallelism structures where you say almost the exact same thing, like maybe um, ellipsis or something like that. There does seem to be some role for copying, and Transformer XL uh, evidently is better able to do that, where such copying would not be properly. Uh, nested. So I think that I take that to mean that um, simple pen tree bank phrase structure uh, is not the end all be all. There, there are more properties of uh, uh, syntax that we should be integrating into our theoretical models um, and maybe, you know, copying and parallelism is one of them. So that number here, the 32, is, is based on, is it, I was wondering on that slide, I didn't mm -hmm. ask, um, but is it like based on the ability to predict the next part of speech, or is it actually the identity of the next word? The identity of the next word. Oh. Is that nutty or what? And this is just trained on the um, blip, which is a, a corpus you can download if you're a member of in good standing of the LDC. Um, you know, it, it's practical to retrain that you don't need to be a big tech company to retrain that. All right, uh, if there are no further questions either online or in the in the room here, then uh, let's uh, thank our speaker. And again, at 6 p.m., uh, Ratskeller, uh, City of Leipzig, uh, Planet Earth, um, find your way. We'll be happy to see you there. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming out.